Hi. All right. We have uh, quite a few people on and I think people are going to join us as we go. So I'm going to go ahead and get started so that we can keep this on time. We uh, anticipate using the entire 90 minutes to cover the material we have in front of us today. So I'm going to get started. Um, thank you all so much for joining us and uh, working with us on this brave new world of technology that we're using to get the information that you need out to you. So here we go. Uh, we're going to get started. And uh, before we dive right into content, I do just want to acknowledge that we are able to offer this free training as a result of two grants from the Monmouth County Department of Human Services Division of Behavioral Health Services that were awarded to the Mental Health Association of Monmouth County in collaboration with the Society for the Prevention of Teen Suicide and the YMCA of Greater Morris County, Monmouth County. These were suicide prevention grants, but with the onset of COVID-19, it became apparent that activities that had been previously scheduled needed to change, not only because of the obvious need for physical distancing, but also due to our changing needs as a professional community. In recent weeks, the MHA has reached out to licensed professionals throughout Monmouth County, asking for volunteers to provide one to six supportive counseling telehealth sessions to individuals in need of emotional support. As of today, more than 70 have come forward towards this effort. As Wendy DePedro, CEO of Mental Health Association of Monmouth County shared with us in regard to this webinar series, these trainings have been developed with our volunteers and all of you in mind as we strive to provide all of you with what you need to get yourselves and those you support through these unprecedented times. Great. So um, today's topic uh, is our starting point, unpacking and taking a look at how COVID-19 is impacting us. We know the impact is large and we've broken it down into more manageable pieces because something we know is that breaking things down to manageable pieces is helpful, especially when many of us are on overload. I also want to take a moment here to point out that although we started out and developed this webinar series for the 70 volunteers who stepped up to provide those telehealth services, as we developed it, we made sure to provide information that was applicable to clinicians providing all sorts of different services. And so when we talk about client or when we uh, give an example about using something for a client, rest assured that material is also useful when you're delivering services to a student and when you're needing something for yourself. It's applicable for everybody because we're all in this collective trauma. We are also planning on putting together a webinar over the summer specifically designed for people who work in school settings. So that's to be, that's to be announced. All right, so here we are. Um, today you'll be working, you'll be hearing from both Maureen and I. My name is Marnie Rhoda. I think that I've emailed with almost all of you. Uh, Maureen and I have worked together for 18 years. First, produce, providing psychoeducational groups to families impacted by September 11, and then taking what we learned to populations impacted by Superstorm Sandy, suicide, and other traumatic events. We have trained mental health professionals on the models we created and on supporting clients through some of life's most difficult challenges. That being said, the impact of COVID-19 has taken our breath away at times as we know it has yours. All right, so, Speak to that end and as far as adapting to what you guys are telling us, um, so many of you were so great and when you registered went ahead and told, and told us what your concerns, difficulties and questions were. A lot of you had specific telehealth concerns um, and mentioned that was something you were struggling with. So we added a little bit right here and we'll you know, continue to add it throughout the webinar series about telehealth and how to, and how to work with telehealth. So telehealth, for all its benefits, has some challenges, and I know you know that you're experiencing them. However, I think it's important to remember that for some clients, it might be easier to work with you through telehealth than seeing you in person. For others, though, it's a real struggle. I, I feel like one of the first steps in getting a handle on telehealth is for you to take a moment and check in with where you are in that continuum 
from loving telehealth to hating telehealth or where, and where you fall in the middle of that. Once you get a handle on your own perception, that allows you to keep it separate and allows you to make room for your client's own experience, which might very well be different from yours. You might hate telehealth and you might have clients who love it and vice versa. When it comes to privacy concerns, what we're seeing is that that's on both ends. Both you need to have some privacy in your telehealth sessions and your client needs to have some privacy. We know that a lot of you are working from your cars, working from closets, finding, you know, finding corners in your house that you can work from, and probably your clients are doing the same thing. If clients are concerned about privacy, one of your jobs is to help them be creative and find a solution. That solution might be sometimes even taking a walk if it's safe in their neighborhood so they can talk to you outside of the ears of their family. Another telehealth concern is the feeling that it's hard to connect with people, which is true. It's it, in, you know, we've seen lots of articles now about Zoom fatigue and whether you're on the phone or using video, video conference abilities, it's not the same as being in the same room as, as, the, as your client. So something that you can do and that you really need to do to bridge that gap is to make sure you're asking, not guessing, what's happening over there with the client. So you might, you, because you could read this, the silence or you could read their tone differently than perhaps they actually feel. So you can ask, what's going on over there with you? How does that sound? Do I hear a smile? Those kind of questions can bridge the gap and start creating a dialogue where you acknowledge the fact that it's not necessarily as easy to connect and that you're going to work hard with them to find a solution. It really kind of makes up for the gap in the visual body language cues that you can't see. The last thing I want to mention about telehealth is that it's okay to allow some silence. So it's awkward. Um, I had to count in my head in order to allow three seconds of silence. Um, allow some silence, not tons, but some, because it's easy to talk over the needed silent spaces when you can't read someone's body language, when they're waiting and preparing and thinking about something to say. So don't feel you need to fill the spaces all the time. You can ask questions and then allow a little space for your client to answer. Okay. So um, in designing our content, we did listen to you, but also we took a look at what was out there already research-wise about COVID-19 and the effect it had on clinical situations. In early April, the National Association of Crisis Organization Directors conducted a survey that was commissioned by the American Association of Suicidology uh, that specifically looked at the clinical challenges that were being faced. We organized the entire webinar series around those challenges because we knew if, if they were being faced in April that they're still being faced in May and in June and going forward. Today's webinar is going to look at some of those challenges. The ones we're going to tackle today are the fact that clinicians don't have enough education about COVID and trauma. It's un no one can know. It's never happened before. Uh, people People who never had mental health problems are becoming unhinged. They're struggling in ways they never did before. That's very frightening for them. And we all are worrying about what is to come. So here's our plan of attack. We know that there's a lot of other trainings out there and we know there's resources available to you. Our goal is to come up with a more personal approach to the, the situation and we did, that, we did that by designing those workbooks, which I, you should all have a PDF of. If you don't, you can just shoot me an email and uh, I will get you a PDF of it. Uh, but we designed workbooks to supplement each webinar. It was kind of a way to have it physically with you, even though we couldn't be physically with you. Uh, we also designed our content in a way that we intersperse our, the information, the hard level content, the clinical information, with real life tips for application. So throughout the webinar series and throughout today, what you'll see is we tell you facts and then we tell you here's what to do with them. That brings it, that makes it more personal so that you know right away, you have action tips right away. And the other part of our plan that we've built into everything we do is that we come up for air. We do that because we're working with heavy subject matter and we know that we all need to take a break and come up for air 
Otherwise, we won't be able to process heavy information. Finally, I just want to mention and acknowledge that our content isn't exhaustive. It can't be in an hour and a half, in, in four hour and a half webinars. It's not exhaustive. It's meant to give you foundational knowledge to ground your existing skills and support the good work you are now doing. So the basis of our approach, and you can go ahead and just read that slide right there um, because that's what we're facing. That's just the reality of the situation. The basis of, basis of our approach recognizes that trauma-informed care during a pandemic is a new situation for all of us. So we wanted to provide you with an understanding of the theory that, that grounds trauma-informed care first, so that, the, so that you can then have a clinical perspective for understanding what might be going on with your clients, and that will make it easier for you to provide psychoeducation to those clients because that's an important element in providing trauma-informed care. So I, we wanna acknowledge that this webinar, which has now reached 204 participants, is full of people who really know what they're doing. We know you guys are good at your jobs. We know you've been doing this for some of you for a long time. You probably, we know that you already know the basics of crisis management, and some of you are probably subject matter experts in that. We also know that you're adjusting to a new method of clinical care that at times is energizing and in times is stressful and exhausting. We know that you know what grief feels like and looks like and that you know how to validate that grief. But in some circumstances, sometimes you know there's also nothing that can be said. We know you have a personal perspective of trauma, which sometimes translates to what your clients are saying and sometimes doesn't. And we know that you know the basic principles of self-care, but probably don't practice them as much as you ought to. Finally, we know that you, like us, have your own set of worries about the time we're living in. Which brings me to another poll. Um, so in this poll, I wanted to, we were curious how comfortable you are now, prior to the webinar material being delivered to you, in providing trauma-informed care. So I'm gonna go ahead and open up another poll, right? How comfortable are you right now with your background and experience in trauma-informed care? That's a scaled question. I'm gonna give you guys a couple of minutes to answer it. It just helps us get a feel for who's in the room. All right, so the results are coming in. By the way, it's very fun. I wish you could watch them live come in. It's pretty cool. All right, they stopped coming in. Here is what we know. Okay, so most of you ha have heard the term trauma-informed care before and you know what it is. Um, and what I see, the majority of, of you are pretty comfortable most of the time, which makes sense. Uh, and we get it. We also know that doing something, like that doing something like this during a crisis becomes tiresome and weary. And we hope that by providing you with a quick primer on the basics and then applicable steps of how to implement them, we'll be able to shore up your reserves and help you get these things done. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing the poll. And I'm going to turn the video camera and the microphone over to Maureen Underwood, who's going to take you through some of this really important information. And while she's talking, I'll be listening and taking a look at your questions, okay? Thanks, Marnie. You're welcome. Hello, everybody. Um, I want to join Marnie in welcoming you today and kind of go over what our plan was. Um, you know, at, at, we kind of knew that a lot of you were going to have experience with trauma-informed care. So we're, we really have very limited objectives and we've set limited objectives, not just for this webinar, but for the others as well, because there's only so much you can do in an hour and a half. And we want you all to try to feel like you get some takeaway. So we're going to talk a little bit about you know, what trauma-informed care is and how you use it with your clients and with yourself. Um, those of you who have been to any of the trainings that, that we've done before know that 
the way we do trainings is we start out with theory. We think it's really, really important that you ground everything you do in either evidence-based practice or some theory. So we're going to give you that, but we're going to give you that. And, and my guess, as I said, is I think a lot of you are going to know it already, but we're going to give you that um, in very conversational ways so you can use it to provide psychoeducation um, to the people that you're working with. And the last thing I want to say about this is that some of the things that we're going to be talking to you about are things that you just normally do intuitively. You, you just know them. But hopefully what you're going to find out is not only are you doing the right thing, but you're going to figure out you got the right reasons for doing it as well. So in terms of trauma's application um, to the pandemic, this is a pretty simple definition. And what I want you to know is if you've looked at your workbooks at all, what you'll find in your workbook is that we've got a reference for you to um, trauma-informed care in behavioral health settings. It's an online reference from SAMHSA. It's a 300 and some odd page uh, workbook that you can actually download if you want. But we wanted to give you what we think is really the most accurate information. And this is kind of a, a summary of a variety of factors and, and a variety of definitions. And, and this is what we're going to be using today. First of all, I think the important words in here, we talk about that violation um, of the ideas and expectations we have about ourselves in the world. The fact that there are a variety of responses that create uncertainty and that there is a collective impact to what we're doing and what we're going through right now. The impact of pandemics really comes from research that was done after Ebola. And it showed that after that pandemic and during that pandemic, the reactions that were most common were stress, distress, depression, and PTSD. So those are some of the things that are going to be kind of underlining a lot of what we're going to be talking about. The definition we use um, is kind of an amalgam definition, as I said, it's in your resources. And the things I just want to point out about this is this is a strengths-based approach. We are not using a medical model. We are not using a pathology approach. Um, even when we talk to you about some clinical issues, we're not going to talk to you about them in, in diagnostic ways. We're going to talk to you about them in ways you can use them um, to support or work with a client rather than for a diagnostic purpose. Um, we know that trauma affects multiple systems, um, physical, emotional, psychological, it creates safety issues, and there's uh, that need to rebuild a sense of control. I want to go back, though, to that line about safety, and I want to point out to you that it reads that it's emotional safety for both the providers and the survivors. In my experience in working with trauma, one of the things that I've noticed is that sometimes it's very, very hard for those of us who are caregivers um, to be providing support to ourselves. Um, and as you can see, this is the benefit of, of working in Zoom. You have your family members who become part of your team. So, what we want to focus on is everything you're going to hear, we are going to talk about not just doing things with your clients, but doing the same thing for yourself. So that's the thread that's going to run through. Um, we also are going to talk about very, very briefly, the impact of trauma on the brain. As you know, there's a lot of information about trauma in the brain. We've also given you the seminal research on this. Um, the reference is uh, Bessel van der Kock. So for those of you who are familiar with that, you've got the book on that if you want to look into this a little bit more. All we want to say today is what you probably already know is that when we're in an acute trauma, and this really does characterize an acute trauma, what happens is our brain stem automatically reacts by activating that fight, flight, collapse, freeze response in our amygdala. And so what happens is that we all react by, we can become angry, we can want to fight to defend ourselves, we can feel the urge to flee and run, or there are those of us who are like deer in the headlights and we kind of freeze. And 
the deal is even if we're freezing and we're in a state of what we feel like is almost paralysis inside our brain and our body it's a very high stress environment and there's elevated levels of stress hormones which really make problem solving in that prefrontal cortex overwhelmed um, so while your brain is trying to do its job to save your life it doesn't kind of realize that you don't need that but it's an explanation for why you may feel so fatigued and tired all the time. So what do you do with this information? Um, these are the slides we told you about you're gonna see after we give you every piece of kind of psychoeducation. You'll see a slide that'll say, how, what's your job? How do you use this with your clients? And then how do you use this with yourself? Well, with your clients, the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna educate them about that typical trauma response. And you can use the explanation we just gave you because it really is conversational. What that does to folks is it helps them understand that the reactions make sense, that they're not going crazy. When you give somebody a biological explanation, you're debunking all of those personal definitions that either you yourself or the people around you might put on your responses. Like, oh, come on, you're so weak. Can't you cope with anything? You're just too sensitive. Um, so if you use psychoeducation, what you're in fact doing is you're activating that different part of the brain. You're going to the prefrontal cortex. And I think Marnie is going to give us a good example of how she used this actually with one of her kids. Yes. Hi, Maureen. Thanks. I watched this work in real life more than once when I was uh, raising my kids when they were younger. My oldest, when she was about four, would have pretty extreme meltdowns. I would say probably very extreme meltdowns and it was hard to deal with. And then we got a tip from someone that we needed to just ask her a simple question unrelated to her meltdown, mid meltdown. So um, my husband tried the first time. He said to her as she was raging, what's two plus two? And she stopped in her tracks. She paused, she answered four, and just like that, the blood flow had moved to the front of her brain and she didn't return to her meltdown. She moved towards the four-year-old version of problem solving communication and it was miraculous and it worked for quite some time with her. Thanks, Lauren. So you can see how just that shift in focus, that distraction um, can facilitate that adaptation of coping skills with the kids or the clients you're working with. How you use this information with yourself is it's important to remember our brains are no different than the brains of our clients. And that in particular, when you're in a high stress environment, and we'll talk about, you know, doing crisis work in a little bit and the stress that puts on us, but that Fatigue is really an almost expected consequence of an overworked brain. It's just what you think would happen. So you have to step back and really ask yourself, how much can you process? And it's critical to not feel like a failure when you acknowledge your own limits. I think, you know, one of the things that's been most challenging for me in all of this is recognizing I really need to learn to say no more. Um, and that doesn't mean that I'm a failure. It just means I'm trying to do a better job of taking care of myself. The other kind of theory base that we want to talk about is a little bit about trauma um, as a crisis. And this is another one of those conversational definitions that comes from mental health literature, um, but everybody gets it. It's a situation in which we feel we've got to do something. and We don't think that we're going to be able to do it. Um, what happens when we're in a crisis situation is we have psychological stress. We often feel out of control. We can't predict what's going to happen. The typical outlets we would use for coping, we can't use. And we often get worried things are going to get a lot worse. So let me just give you a short example of that. I think that spoke to me because I think it's important for us to know we have all dealt with many, many crises in our lives. This just happens to be the new one. So I want you to think for a second. And I want you to imagine you're, it's at night, it's a rainy night, 
and you're on your way to a really important appointment. Um, this has to do with some work that you're counting on to help you get through some of the financial slump that's been caused by the impact of COVID on you or your family. So you're on this rainy night, you're driving along on this back New Jersey road, some of which of course have no lights at all. It's hard to see and your car engine light goes on and your motor dies. So you kind of pull over and you think, oh, it's going to be okay. You get your phone out and you're going to try to call for help, but you have no reception. And that also means you have no GPS. So there's no traffic. There's no lights you can see. It started to rain harder and you're starting to get really, really panicked. So if you think about crisis intervention. The goal of a crisis intervention is to keep you physically safe and alive until the crisis has resolved. And that may seem like a little hyperbole in this situation. I mean, you know, what do you mean stay alive? Your car's on a back road. But my guess is there may be some of you, or if it's not you, you may know people who, in fact, their coping solution for that would be to leave the car. Um, to take off down that long, dark road to see if they can get some help. And you know, it might turn out well, but maybe it doesn't. So I think you get a sense that um, sometimes the ways we solve or don't solve crises can really have life-threatening consequences. And there is a way to process crisis intervention. This is um, one of those seminal texts. You'll notice that it's um, Al Roberts' book from the 1991. But uh, as I said before, I'm trying to give you new resources, but I also think that there's some, some things that have been written that they just don't get better than that. And these are really the seven stages of crisis intervention. And you'll notice it kind of takes you from beginning that assessment of lethality and safety needs, moves you all the way on up to where you're identifying the problem. And I want to just point out, it says presenting problem. We'll talk about that in a sec. And then on up to where you come up with an action plan and you do follow up. As you can see, um, this really differs from other forms of counseling that you may be providing because it really focuses on delivering short-term treatment to resolve a crisis immediately. Other therapeutic methods focus on securing kind of long-term mental health or mental, mental health well-being. Um, but this is short-term. And the one thing that I want to point out to you on this that we've really been learning in the last several years that's so critically important is the top of this pyramid, which is follow-up. Um, the most exciting research, I think, that's come out of the um, zero suicide um, movement in this country has been that follow-up, uh, especially after people have had some kind of psychiatric hospitalization for suicide, simple follow-up in months after that hospitalization, which could be as simple as a postcard, really can do a whole lot to reduce any kind of recidivism. So I, I share that with you right now because you're going to be working with a lot of folks in brief ways and it really is important to figure out how you can check in with them um, to see how they're doing. So when you look at these seven stages, what do you do? Again, those of you who have been in, in any of our trainings know these are our three favorite words. If you learn nothing else today but these three words, you'll walk away with something in your back pocket. Um, and it's really providing support control and structure. It's a simple magic formula. What we know in a crisis is that a support system, a natural support system, especially if it's a, it's a crisis that affects a group, usually collapses for about the first 24 hours. Again, when you think of you know, what may have been your first 24 hours of this crisis when you realized, wow, this really was um, something to get concerned about. The people that you normally turn to might not have been there. Um, what we're seeing in COVID is that the collapse of support just because we have to employ that physical distance can really last for a long time. We can't go to our usual sources of support, which often can make us feel out of control. I don't know how many times um, I have heard, if you listen to the briefings uh, on the news or read things online, is the message that we are not in control. 
the virus is in control. So our sense of support has gone away and, and control has gone away. And when we're out of control, we can feel a loss of organization and structure. The normal way um, that we have lived our lives has really collapsed. So what do you do with that? Well, first of all, I think that just using that very simple explanation that psychoeducations with your clients or students is really, really helpful. You know, support, control, and structure are three easy things. And you know, if, if you're talking about using this with your clients, you, you hold every intervention up to, does it provide support, control, and structure? And if you can answer yes, you're doing something that's helpful. You can teach your clients and even kids the same thing. Are you providing yourself with support, control, and structure? And if the answer to those three questions is yes, you're probably doing a good job. In a, in a crisis contact, it's really important um, for you to be pretty active. In some forms of psychotherapy, I know, you may be less directive and less active, but when you're doing crisis intervention, you're very active and you're gonna really help create structure. That's some of what your activity does. And by creating structure, what you're doing is you're helping your client feel some degree of control. Crisis, um, requires us to figure out some ways we feel like we're managing our lives. And if you think about how a lot of people are trying to get control these days, all you have to do is go to the grocery store and look for flour and yeast. Um, most of the time you can't find one or the other or both. And I think that a way that a lot of people are trying to get control over their life is baking. Because as you know, there's a real structure in baking. You have to gather the ingredients, you put them all together, um, you have to kind of organize them in a pan, get them into the oven, they bake for a certain amount of time, and then you take them out. So there's a real structure to that that helps us feel like there's at least something in our lives that's going according to plan. Um, the other thing that I want to say to you that's important about this is that even if you're dealing with clients that you've worked with before, when you've got somebody in crisis, crisis supersedes any other treatment goal. It comes to the front because um, you got to deal with that before you can get anything else. Now, I know that some of you are those folks who are answering those crisis lines. And, um, you know, having answered crisis lines in my day, I know that sometimes you get a call from somebody you don't know and they list 27 problems in their life. Um, your first question that that person about those 27 problems is, well, what made you call right now? What is it right now that you feel is pushing you over the edge? That tells you what the crisis is, and that's what you're going to work on to resolve immediately. You're not going to be able to do those 27 other things, but you can do that one crisis. Um, and I think one of the things that's pretty important, um, and I, I want to go back to that structure piece because I think it's so critical, is helping people understand that they may have to change the way that their life had been structured before. And I think, you know, Marnie, you've got an example of that for us. I do. This is actually a personal example um, about how I, real, how I realize I really need to shift my expectations and my understanding of my daily and my life structure. So in the first few weeks of shelter in place, I uh, realized and I was really missing my routine. I had my routine before and one of the things about my routine that helped me was my routine helped me feel good about myself. I did the things I was supposed to do and at the end of the day, I was successful and I felt good. Well, when I didn't do those things because I couldn't because of shelter in place, I started to feel not as good about myself and a little bit empty. When I made the decision to restructure my vision for myself and my understanding of my day and decided that I was gonna have to pare down what my day looked like and what my routine looked like and restructured myself, I was then able to do my thing and have my day and at the end of the day, do a check-in with myself and feel okay about what I did because I did the things on my new routine. So it was really for me a way of changing my expectations um, to help me feel better about my life uh, during shelter in place. 
That's a great example, Marnie, because I think the other piece of what you just said was it's about restructuring not just the physical things in your life, but your expectations about your life um, and coming up with a different vision of that for yourself. Using this for yourself, um, I think that, you know, that example of 27 problems reminds me um, it's not up to us to fix everything. We can't. There's no way you can fix all of what's going on right now. And in fact, you're not even going to be able to calm everybody down right away. Um, you know, one of the things I learned in practice, um, you know, I was a pretty big idealist and I thought, oh, I, I, you know, I've learned all these things to do and these techniques and, and the right words to say. And I realized, first of all, sometimes there's not right words and sometimes people need to just vomit up as what they're feeling and what they're thinking and they need to do it as long as they need to do it. So I learned that particularly when I had somebody who was in a pretty big crisis to sit back to just kind of validate them non-verbally and wait. And what I often found was at the end of their recitation, when they had said everything they needed to say, I would often hear a very deep sigh. And when I would hear that, I knew it was time for me to go in to start doing some, pro some problem solving. So it was really that kind of stepping back, um, you know, the other thing in this that, that it is critical in terms of crisis intervention, and it, it comes, comes up in relation to what we're hearing about COVID, is a lot of what people are saying about COVID is it's a marathon. This isn't a sprint. We're going to be in it for a long time. Well, those of you who are doing crisis intervention, you know it's a sprint. It's not a marathon. You got to be in there. You got to work fast. You, you don't have time to take breaks. You have to help someone um, with every single client you're sprinting. And P.S. Th what that is, is extra exhausting. So I think it's really, really important for you to figure out ways to support yourself. And I think Marnie is going to take us through another short poll on this. Yes. Hi, guys. So uh, I'm going to launch a poll. I want to add in right before we launch the poll that um, I love I love the way that you guys are using chat and the question and answer. Please feel free to put your questions here as Maureen is talking. If it makes you if you want to know, well, practically, how do I do that? Or is that the same as this? Feel free to put them in. It's not interrupting the flow of her work. I'll manage them and I'll jump in when I can to get them to her or I'll we'll type you the answers. So please feel free to put your questions in because we wanna make sure at the end of this webinar, you don't have hanging questions that you didn't get to ask, okay? So that being said, um, we're gonna launch another poll. This poll is designed to check in with you about um, when was the last time you gave yourself support because we know that you are sprinting and there's no way you can keep that pace up without taking a break. So um, go ahead and answer the poll. All right, answers are still coming in, Maureen. And I think you all can see we were coming up for air when we wrote this poll. Yeah. <laughs> we had to come up for air a lot while we designed this webinar. <laughs> there was lots of coming up for air. Okay, so that I think everyone's probably answered. I'm going to go ahead and share the results. Everyone can see here. Um, Maureen, look at this. The majority of people wow. are taking are, are coming are giving themselves support every day, which I just want to acknowledge is amazing. I mean, good for you. Um, good, good, good for you. I think that it's important. Um, very, very few of you. Um, thought that the last time was in high school. What I'll say is those some of you might be, be just out of high school. Maybe that's why. Um, <laughs> um, here's, here's, here's the thing though. We know this is important. Um, we're going to talk more about ways to do that. Um, and taking care of ourselves during this is essential. So thanks for sharing. I think we can move on. Okay, so uh, we, uh, we wanted to make sure that we put in some really deep foundational information. Most of us learn this in Psychology 101, if not before. What, what makes this especially important now for us, however, is the fact that many, many, many of us 
have our have been pulled down to the bottom of this hierarchy with physiological needs and safety and safety needs being in jeopardy. So people who weren't often down here are back down here again. The other thing that we really do want to acknowledge about this is that this pandemic is clearly having a different impact on the poor, on marginalized people and on minorities. And we know that's true. And we know that disproportionately they are having more difficulty with their physiological and safety needs. Uh, and that's part of what's happening right now. So what do you do about that? Uh, what we feel is important. What we feel is important first off is acknowledging the fact that during this crisis, it is the case that people are struggling with those basic needs, and it's your job to ask. If someone isn't bringing it up, it's okay if you check in with them. How are they doing with food? How's work at home going? How are finances in general? Are you doing okay? Are you are you feeling confident about that? What's the switch like to being a stay-at-home teacher in addition to a state, you know, working from home, all those things. Because we know there's been an increase in reports of domestic violence, it's also really important that you check in with people and you check in on their personal safety and how safe uh, they feel and how safe they feel for people in their, in their household. A way you can do that is simply say, some people aren't feeling safe in their homes right now, are you? That's a good way to start that conversation. And I wanna say that even though we're encouraging you to ask about these basics, the safety, um, the, having the needs met and, and safety being, being assured, it doesn't mean that you're staying there. What we're asking you to do is you ask them how the facts and then you start to help move them up the hierarchy by asking about their feelings about those facts. And Maureen, do you have a story about this? Um, well, I think that that's just a really important thing to do because I, I think that sometimes um, we, you know, we don't give ourselves credit um, for what we're doing to help people. And especially now, I think that there's a lot of recognition that folks who are doing healthcare in a hospital setting um, are really the people on the front line and they're the heroes. Um, and they're addressing those physical needs. But I, I think it's so, so important in using this for yourself that you recognize that you're addressing those emotional needs, which may be even sometimes more challenging. So you're mm -hmm. helping people move up that hierarchy. Yes. Um, someone asked a question. I thought maybe you could, you could speak to it. They were okay. asking, um, when it comes to basic needs, how do you help a client who's, the, the, they're isolated, they're dealing with isolation and their basic need of, of being part of a community or society or being around people isn't being met? Do you have tips for that? Um, it, it's certainly, you know, one of the bigger challenges with this um, physical distancing. And, um, you know, it was interesting because I was just reading some survey responses from a, um, a bunch of high school kids that we had, um, uh, collected, and there were over 400 kids who had responded. And what they talked about was the real important need of staying connected and forcing themselves, uh, and more kids said this than, than I had expected, forcing themselves to reach out to people they knew, even it was if it was people they didn't know there very well, to just say hello and to just ask how they were doing. And for some of them, it was sitting on their porch, watching people in the neighborhood goodbye, go by, saying hello to the people in the neighborhood. But it's, it requires you to push yourself out of your safety zone um, to think about those ways to make those connections because it's really tough right now. Thanks, um, Maureen. Um, and this kind of brings us to kind of what we're talking a little bit about next um, is really looking at what we had come to look at as a concept, I'm um, putting this in sort of an environmental perspective and looking at both an inner and an outer community. And so maybe kind of to add to the answer to that question I just gave, when you can't connect so much with your outer, outer community, maybe it's connecting with that internal sense of yourself. So let's go through these and see if, if you can kind of apply that in something in, in, to this. Um, in our outer community, which is kind of our country, most of the world, what we've really been seeing 
um, is that we're, we're experiencing, at least up until now, what we, we might have considered to be universal agoraphobia. I mean, people really being scared to go out. And there haven't been those real strategies for universal remediation. So even though people are um, venturing out now, uh, uh, there's still some questions about the level of safety, and I know that some people that you know are even going out are still frightened about it. The other thing I think that happens in terms of our outer world, we we feel helpless in the same way we felt helpless after September 11th, and what we did after September 11th was we made the enemy into something we could visualize. It became Al-Qaeda, it became Osama bin Laden, and there were some attempts to do that at the beginning of this crisis. Um, we were talking about the Wuhan crisis, or we were talking about the China virus, and when you can name your fear and put a target on it, it's a lot easier to contain it. But when the enemy is silent, when it's invisible, and maybe living inside of some of your family members, it's much harder to convince yourself that either you or your country um, can protect you. And what we've seen is that, you know, we kind of changed our definition of patriotism um, right at the beginning, it became very patriotic to stay at home. Um, in previous wars, um, since we've you know, been calling this a war in some ways, how people got mobilized was to get busy and do things. And for this enemy, um, we really had to have a very static environment um, rather than going out and being really active. And what that's done, in some ways, it's divided rather than unify us. And I think you can see that now um, as more and more people are realizing that in order to, to kind of exercise what they perceive to be their inalienable rights, um, they're going out and they're protesting and they're carrying the American flag with them, which is our symbol of patriotism. So you've got the folks who are doing that and then the, the others who are staying home. And so you're beginning to sense some of that division and it's hard to know when the end is in sight. In terms of our inner sense of ourselves, and that's kind of what we call our, our inner community. For many of us, there's been a change or a disconnection from our identified roles. When, when we new, meet new people, typically the first question that anybody ever asks somebody is, oh, and what do you do for a living? Um, well, if you look at how many people in our workplace have been furloughed, who have lost their jobs, um, that's their primary sense of identity. Um, so there's a real disconnection for that. And then you look at all the others um, who have been forced into that new role as a teacher, and they feel pretty incompetent in that role. So there's that inner sense of who we are and what we do. The other thing is that for most of our lives, We've lived under the mantle of American exceptionalism, that we're the richest, we're the most productive, we're the most powerful nation on earth. And even if you still believe that, um, it, you, all you have to do is listen to the news for a week to see that our reputation is kind of battered overseas. The only thing that we excel in in regard to the world right now is we have the most cases of COVID. Um, if you look at the stock market and our unemployment rates, it's hard to hold on to that American obsession with positivity. Um, and even on top of that is it's hard in this country. It's hard in this world um, for many of us to believe there's not a lesson. What, what do you mean there's no lesson? Isn't there a reason for everything? Come on, there's got to be something. And there are still some people who think so, and I'm sure you've heard some people who are trying to make sense of this. It's a, it's a new start. God is trying to remind us we've become too materialistic. You may even have a lesson or two in the back of your mind because it's much more comforting to think that there's a reason for this than there's no reason at all. 
Um, and I think maybe even at a, at a deeper level, that daily presentation that we have with death, um, those death tolls, really what they do is confront us with our own mortality um, in a very deep way. Um, you know, most of us never think about our own. It's only when we're presented with death that that sort of creeps into our line of vision. Most of the time it's outside of it. And unfortunately, that's really been presented to us every day. So what do you do with this? How do you use this? Because again, there's no real end in sight. What do you do with this with your clients? Well, I think what you want to do um, is to help your client identify the ways in which that outer world and that internal sense of themselves can be compromised. And with that person who's feeling so isolated and alone, I think to look at just, not just that internal sense of isolation, but helping them understand that external sense of isolation as well, um, that can really kind of help them understand why they're feeling so uncomfortable or they're feeling so overwhelmed. Because again, an explanation gives structures to confusing and disconnected feelings. Um, and when you explain that piece about the outer world, you really validate that they are not alone. That whole deal about you are not alone can kind of sound like a bit of a platitude sometimes. So I think the more you can make it real and say, hey, let's take a look at this. You're not the only one feeling this way. And when you know you're not the only one feeling the same way, there is some comfort in numbers. Um, and I think that this can also clarify some of the coping strategies um, that they can prioritize and the things that they can't. Um, and I think that what you can also try to help them do maybe is even create some sort of artificial structure. And Marnie, I think you've got a great example of this. I do, yes. Hi. Um, yeah, so... Uh, I got this example from one of the clinicians who registered for the webinar and we ended up uh, talking over the phone as part of that registration. She gave me this great visual when she was talking about her situation. She said that she had had her life pre-COVID well organized in separate boxes. And each of those boxes contained one of her roles or the aspects of her life. She had, she has many different clinical roles and they were all neatly organized in boxes as well as her role as a mom and a wife. When shelter in place came about, she had the experience of really all those boxes collapsing in on themselves and on each other. And it was a mess and that, that sense of organization structure uh, was gone. And I think that's something that we can all really identify with, this idea that everything's kind of collapsed close together into one place. And I think it's important to acknowledge and to the extent that we can, and I, you know, I gave the other example about the, the kind of mental structure and this, and I think to some extent in these cases, we need to maybe create some physical structure. So um, separating um, places the best we can uh, when possible. Um, the person I was speaking to had a pretty extreme um, uh, method she used, but she really needed to based on the nature of her work. Um, she had her husband build, put up the tent, the family tent in the backyard. And she was using that tent for some of her more challenging clinical uh, cases and work that she was doing to physically separate it from her household and the rest of the work. And although um, that extreme of an example might not be my network for all of us, I think creating some kind of physical distance can be really helpful right now. Thanks, Marty. I think that's it. I, and I appreciate the person who shared that with you because I think it's a great example. What we're going to turn to now um, is probably the last really serious foundational um, aspect of this. Um, and, and you have the seminal work on this listed um, on your resource list as well. Because I think that, you know, when I learned about this, as I said, I've been working in trauma um, for many, many years. I started working with Pan Am 103. So that shows you in the 90s. Um, when I kind of got this information about these basic assumptions about life that are shattered, it made an amazing difference in my understanding myself and what I was able to do with clients. So what a basic assumption is, is that's, that's a perception we make about life when we're kids. We start it when we're very little um, and we take in information from our family, from our, our 
um, experiences around us, our neighborhood, our religion, um, and we pull these all together and we make expectations about the world and ourselves that let us get up every day and go into a world that we could perceive as dangerous. So, for example, you know, one of the things that we usually tend to believe is people pay attention to laws. So that's what lets us get up and get in our car and go drive and know that people are going to stop at a stop sign because that's the law. You stop at a stop sign. So the three fundamental assumptions that most people have that we're going to take a look at very briefly um, are are that the world is meaningful, benevolent, and that we are worthy. So let's take a look at the world as meaningful. This comes from some of the work of a psychologist named Melvin Lerner, and he had what he called the just world theory. And what he said was that people, they have to, they really need to believe that the world is a just place where people get what they deserve and they deserve what they get. Um, the assumption is that we can directly control what happens to us by our own behavior. So when we do appropriate, good things, good things happen to us. If we do negative things, bad things happen to us. So we, we view the world in terms of justice, um, where you know negative events are punishments, and positive ones are rewards. The other way I could kind of describe this is sort of believing that life is fair. We, we, and I, my guess is you have that sense. So how does COVID challenge this for us? Well, first of all, if you think of the populations that have been most affected, and, and you know, the one that is, is pretty heartbreaking for me, are nursing homes, you know? We put family members in, in nursing homes because we want them to be safe. We think they can be cared for better than the way we could care for them ourselves. Um, and look at how devastated they have been by this virus. Um, healthcare workers who have devoted their life to doing the right thing, you know, working in hospital settings, clinic settings, um, if we look at the impact of the illness and deaths on them as well. Is that fair? These are people who are trying to help others, and that's not fair. I mean, what randomness does is really kind of deny that events in the world have meaning which is why I think we spend so much time um, when you listen to the news about COVID on those public health predictions, because we want to be able to somehow say, if we do certain things, we can manage these predictions. We can be in control of these predictions, and it isn't just random. Um, because if we accept that randomness, we really believe there's nothing we can do to protect ourselves from misfortune. And I think that's why some of us get so angry at the people who violate those physical distance rules, because that's what we've been told will work. That's going to be the antidote to randomness. And when we feel that randomness, we feel powerless. We lose our ability to feel like we can take care of ourselves or that our country can take care of ourselves or that our bodies even have any integrity. And I would say to you that one of the ways I think that, that and I don't think people are necessarily doing this consciously, but I think one of the ways um, you know, that um, our country is trying to really address this sense of powerlessness, if you hear when um, there's a description of the people who die, um, we often hear that they had a pre-existing condi condition or they were in a high risk group. So as long as I don't have a pre-existing condition or I'm not in a high risk group, I'm a little bit protected um, from that randomness. So what do you do with your clients about this? Um, I think is that you validate their perception and you explore with them those concepts of randomness um, and unfairness. And what I, what I would tell you is, um, you know, the whole idea of unfairness. Um, I, I, I just got a question yesterday from a, a school counselor who was saying, how do we explain to our kids, and this was in an elementary school, this whole dear idea of unfairness. Because we have kids saying, well, no one in fam my family is sick, so I don't know why we have to stay home. And, you know, I think that that's a, that's a reasonable assumption for kids to make. So I will tell you, one of the, the techniques we learned, and we came upon this with some of the just amazing clinicians we were working with um, in our September 11th work, is we 
you know, we're trying to help kids understand the idea of unfairness. So what we had them do was have a pretend birthday party. And we would ask kids to, you know, talk about the party and, you know, what goes on at birthday parties. And then we asked them to talk about all the unfair things that can kind of happen at birthday parties. You know, you don't get the present that you told everybody that you wanted. Um, you, know, you don't get the piece of cake that has the flower on it. Somebody else got that piece of cake or you were going to have a pool party and you couldn't go outside. And we say, oh, yeah, those are pretty unfair things. Yeah. Well, does that mean you're not going to have a party next year? Well, no, of course I'm going to have a party. Hmm. So despite the fact that unfair things happen to you in life, you're still going to go on, aren't you? So I, I think that that's a good explanation and a good way to kind of think in your head. Use that for the clients and, the, and maybe the kids you work with to come up with some concept of unfairness that they can identify with so that they can begin to see, even though things are unfair, we still go on. You also want to let give people permission to be angry you know, crisis intervention doesn't mean that people who are angry hang up the phone and they're not angry. You're just validating some of the reasons they may be angry, but you want to ask them what are they doing in their family to protect themselves? Because almost every family has something personally they're doing. So if you feel like you're not safe in the outside world, what are you doing in, in your, the world you can control? And don't get ahead of yourself. Stay in the moment. What you do with yourself in terms of this concept of meaningfulness, I think one of the most important things is to step back and to ask, why do you do what you do? My guess is for almost all of you, the reason you chose the career you chose was because you thought it would bring some positive meaning to the world. And I will tell you that hasn't changed. No matter what happens in the larger outside work and the outside world, the work you are doing is good work. Is it always going to be rewarded? I think you knew that wasn't true before this happened. Um, and I think you know a lot about the unfairness in life. What do you do to deal with it? What have you done in the past? Um, I think it's so important to recognize we have skills. This isn't the first rodeo about life unfairness for us. How have we managed it? And I wonder how many of you at the end of the day, at the end of the day, um, really can believe that quotation from Anne Frank. I keep my ideal because in spite of everything, I still believe people are really good at heart. Which moves us to the next assumption about the benevolence of the world. We all like to believe that the world is a good place and assume that other people are basically good, they're kind, they're helpful, they're caring. We really believe in the preponderance of good fortune over negative outcomes. Um, and we tend to be optimistic about our own futures, even when we're not so optimistic about what's going to happen in the rest of the world. And I think you can see that we really are leaning heavily on re reinforcing this assumption right now in every aspect of our lives. Um, benevolence, I think, is related to that concept of heroes. And these are the people, ordinary people, who are just doing their jobs to get us through. It's the healthcare workers, certainly, but it's those grocery store employees. It's the people who are delivering things to your home. It's the person carrying the mail. These are people that we're recognizing now as heroes, as one way to feed into some of that benevolence of the world. Go fund me, the concerts that we're seeing. And my hunch is that both you and the people that you're working with are all trying in some ordinary way to become part of that world's benevolence. So what are you gonna do with your clients is this is why it is important to really reinforce those stories of kindness, give them permission to be angry at those social distance violators, or angry at the social distancing rules, whichever side of the coin that they're on, and encourage them to do very little acts of kindness to counteract helplessness. Helplessness is in action. So the minute you do something to help somebody else or even to help yourself, you've acted your way into helpfulness. So again, you can see even very young children can understand how you move from being helpless 
to helpful. And you want your clients to begin to do some of that. And I think we're going to take a poll now to look at some of the kindness we all have seen. Exactly. So Maureen, this is a great time, I, we thought, for you guys to have some participation. We don't like to talk at you for too long without checking in to see what's going on. I'm launching a poll about benevolence and kindness. Um, just kind of checking in. Maureen and I thought of a lot of different ways we've seen it. We'd love for you guys to go ahead and vote on ways um, that you've seen kindness out there in the world. Uh, if you check the other category and you want to go ahead and um, type your other ideas in chat, share the benevolence and kindness that you've seen with all of us, we'd love it. People are still busily checking off all the different ways they've seen kindness, Maureen. Great. All right, and people are starting to fill in the chat. Go ahead and um, fill in the chat. I'm gonna launch the results so that everyone can see them and people can keep adding things in the chat if they want. Uh, so great, I'm sharing the results now so we can all take a look here at the different ways that we've seen um, uh, what's, what's happening. And um, uh, it seems like the, the most common that people have noticed from their homes and shelter in place is all the concerts um, and plays, operas and musicals that have been live streamed by our artists. They have, it's been a really nice refreshing way to get a look, to, to get a feel of more connection, I think, and to get some benefit from being at home all the time. I know quite a few Broadway musicals and plays um, showed and uh, that was a great opportunity for people to see them. Uh, people are also writing in chat, Maureen, about um, neighborhoods reconnecting outside. That's true, we're getting to know our neighbors again uh, when we're taking walks. Um, oh, oh, that's a great one. I had forgotten about all the people printing face shields on 3D printers. High school, I, I mean, anyone who has a 3D printer has been busy printing face shields, that's been amazing. Um, raising money for people's rental assistance, donating to strangers food and supplies. I know in my town, there's been a ton of that, um, raising money and donating food to people who need it. Um, oh, and this is a great one. A close friend anonymously delivered beautiful tulips to the ladies in our circle. I know that I had even read um, that on May 1st, which is, I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with the holiday of May Day. My mother was very big on May Day when I was growing up. Um, on May 1st, people, um, a lot of people were delivering those May baskets and leaving them anonymously on people's doors, baskets of flowers. So I'm going to stop sharing the results and we can move on. Okay, so we're going to talk about what do you do, how do you do this with yourself, the sense of um, benevolence. It's pretty simple. It's really important to recognize your contributions to the world and not think of that as you're just so full of pride. And when people say to you, um, thank you for doing what you do, instead of just saying, well, it, it's my job, just say thank you. I'll leave you with that. And we'll move to the last assumption we're going to take a look at very quickly is this sense of personal self-worth. We all make global evaluations of ourselves, and we tend to perceive ourselves as good and capable and moral individuals in general. Um, we make judgments, and most of the time, we're pretty positive about ourselves. Um, you know, if any of you have been, maybe you did this before, maybe you just started watching a lot of those cheesy, you know, criminal shows on TV. Um, you know, one of the things you always notice in those criminal shows is criminals always like themselves, and they always give you a reason for what they do. I mean, you know, they had to do it that way. And if, and if they don't like themselves, their mothers always like them. Um, with very few exceptions, people always evaluate themselves positively. And they rank themselves on lots of scales better than average in their self-esteem. Um, and I think that the reason that we felt this was really important for you is because a lot of the people you may be seeing right now are what we call the worried well. They've never talked to counselors before. They've never had any mental health problems. Um, and they've always seen them on, themselves on the upside of the curb. So all of a sudden to be on that downside is really, really disorganizing for them. And when they're disorganized, what we do when we're disorganized, we really are hungry for comforting kind of systems that validate our self-worth. 
um, but most of them have been disrupted. So for example, you know, think of things that you've done before. You may go out to lunch with friends to validate yourself. You may go to church. Um, you may um, go get your hair done. So just think about in some ways, that's what some people are doing um, is the best they can to validate some of their self-worth. And what you want to do, stop trying to fix all the things that are wrong and help them find at least one stabilizing factor, whether it's dyeing their hair, making chocolate chip cookies, something that makes them feel like they're good at something, that's a validation of self-worth. Um, and to truly acknowledge that people do the best they can. Right now we are in uncharted waters, we're swimming uphill, and yeah, sometimes we miss a few strokes and that's totally okay. And what to do with this information with yourself, the very same thing. Now, there's another assumption that I wanted to turn over to Marnie to talk about because I think mm, this may be true for a lot of the people that we're working with that are struggling right now. <laughs> Thanks, Maureen. So something that I've seen is that there are people who hold this assumption. This is one of their life assumptions. Some, they just, some people are lucky and they're not one of the lucky ones. They believe they will never get ahead and that others are going to get ahead. Right now, I think, especially with disenfranchised minorities, this might look pretty close to true. So what they're feeling is pretty close to re real. They feel, they feel they've worked really hard and it's gotten them nothing or everything they worked for has been taken away in an instant through no fault of their own. Can you give me the next slide, Maureen? Thanks. Oh, perfect. All right. So what do you do? Like, how do you handle those situations? I think the first thing is, is the fact that you don't try to change it. Don't try to sugarcoat it. Don't try to dig deep for the benefit of what's happened to them. Acknowledge the fact, validate the fact that it's, it sure looks like that. It sure looks like the, you know, the way you feel is the way things are right now and acknowledge that it's hard. It's a bad situation. You can see their point that they're, that their life view, their perspective is being validated by the evidence around them right now. That's all definitely true. And then I think you can start to ask them to tell you more. Um, get, you know, so validate it so they don't have to keep convincing you of it. And then listen to what comes next. Because I think that what might come next is that even people who think that they're not lucky probably still hold some hopeful assumptions. They probably, they might believe, you know, they might say to you, well, I'm always there for my family. Um, you know, are we take care of ourselves and our family, we help each other out. So that's a hopeful assumption. You've got family behind you. Do you believe in uh, your spirituality? Is, is it God that's gonna help you with this? So once you validate and stop, and stop having them try to convince you that things are bad, you open the door for them being able, for being able to start to see some hopeful assumptions they might have. Thanks, Marty. And what we're gonna do right now is we're gonna switch your vision a little to talk just very briefly about a couple of other clinical issues. Um, and <clears throat> you notice the rose colored glasses on here and the definition of an optimism is someone who doesn't have all the facts. I'm just gonna say a little bit about depressive realism because I think you may be seeing a lot of this as well. This is a term that was coined to suggest the accuracy of people who are depressed, that they really see the world more accurately than their non-depressed counterparts. Um, they're less likely to describe themselves in positive terms or to believe they have control over their situations or to believe their futures are bright. These are not happy people. Um, they, they may have extra receptors for bad signals or they pay more attention to them. Um, and, you know, the problem is when the depression becomes more severe, that accuracy they have morphs into a very negative bias. They become overly pessimistic about themselves, about the rest of the world. But they haven't had their assumptions about the world shattered because they didn't have them. 
Um, you know, the other group of people that we talk about are sometimes called those defensive pessimists, um, people who lean into their anxiety rather than repress it. They really busily imagine the worst outcome and they plan accordingly. Um, the, you can't cheer these people up. Um, as far as they're concerned, their mind is anchored and focused on the things that they have to control to be productive. And the, the thing about this is, is they already have a neurobiology of anxiety in their chemistry and they have defenses and coping strategies that they're using. They actually may feel somewhat reassured, like, welcome to my world, everybody. This is how I feel all the time. These are the people who have an edge um, in reopening. They're gonna still take those precautions. They're gonna guard against getting optimistic in that open, closed roller coaster of the next stage of opening things up. And they're gonna be less likely to be caught off guard when there's as unexpected contingencies arise. And then the other thing we wanted to just kind of go over very, very quickly was trauma generated anger, because we often don't, um, we see this a lot and we may not step back from it to try to figure out what, what is it exactly that we're seeing. And the first is anger that's generated um, as a residual of that fight or flight response. Um, you know, our biological system, as we talked about before, goes into survivor mode when we're in danger. And as we know, once the danger is passed, our bodies often stay in that state of hyperarousal. So it leaves us reacting with anger into normally mildly distressing stimuli. Um, we blow up when people ask us how we are. Um, when we're trying to do that schoolwork, we may find ourselves just exploding. Um, what do you do about it? When on this slide, we're gonna tell you what to do right after we identify the anger. Well, remember, this is physically driven anger. Therefore, what you need to do is something physical to discharge it. So you need to work to kind of bring your body down. So this is why exercise, working out, just walking or moving from one room to another, sleeping, eating, doing something to change your body rhythm can really address this form of anger. The second form of anger we see is, is really something that protects us from helplessness. Um, because our sense of control has been violated, um, if we're in rage, we don't have to feel shame, or blame or really helplessness. Um, we don't have to accept the fact that COVID is a reality beyond our control. So one of the suggestions for this um, is where that those social media platforms can be really helpful. Um, sometimes by just kind of listening to what other people are saying, it can lessen the anger a little. You know, I mean, I know it's true for myself. Sometimes when I hear people saying what I'm thinking, I hear it in a different way and I get a little bit more perspective. So I think that that may be one of the ways that you can help people get a little bit of perspective. You've always known um, that anger is a mask for depression. And what we know is that um, depression is the most common disorder that's suffered in conjunction with PTSD. And in particular, we often see this in men who mask it um, by behavior that's irritable, angry, um, domestic violence can come from this place, um, a lot of somatic complaints. And often they mask it so well, not only do they not recognize it, but the people they're with don't recognize it. So I think sometimes explaining this connection can really be life-saving for people. And then finally, we're going to talk about antidote, uh, using anger as an antidote to loss. One way to avoid grieving is just to stay angry about the loss. Um, it keeps others away from your pain. It keeps you away from your pain. Um, and we're going to use this. Um, we're going to talk about this when we talk about grief next week um, as a way to kind of um, give you some ideas about how you can help people move a little past this as a way to, sh to shield their pain. But I know I've just kind of raced through very quickly a lot of very heavy things. So I wonder if, if Marnie can talk to us a little bit about coming up for air. Absolutely. Maureen, do we have a slide with the swimmer? Let's see. There we go. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Thank you. All right. So um, in a poll, in the poll earlier today, 
over half of you indicated that you do something to support yourself every single day, which is amazing. Maureen and I feel strongly that um, although our tendency might be at the end of the day to take care of ourselves and put our feet up, we feel strongly that especially now, what's needed is to come up for air. So you see our swimmer, she's coming up for air. She's not getting out of the pool. She's just taking a breath, filling her lungs. We need to uh, use, a, use the technique of coming up for air maybe every hour or so. It can be a five minute break, but it's an opportunity to come up for air so that you can start to feel better. Um, and then you can dive back in and do the hard work of swimming, do the hard work of what you do. Coming up for air um, often uh, is useful when you're doing these five minute breaks, it's useful just to have a sensory change. So you can get up and walk around. You can go outside, have a cup of tea. Maureen will tell you to have a piece of chocolate. There's her chocolate. Eh, thanks, Maureen. That's exactly You're welcome right now. So um, we thought we'd do a poll as far as how do you come up for air? Because we know it's important. And if you have a couple techniques you use, if we want you to do it every hour or so, you might need to add more to the mix. So I'm going to go ahead and launch that poll. It is our last poll for today. Great, so the poll is running. Go ahead and put it in. One more time, feel free to share your ideas that aren't listed here with your fellow attendees using the chat feature. Results are still coming in, Maureen. Oh, you hey. know what? Some, someone's already added in chat the one that I had wished I put here, which was petting someone, petting their dog or cat. Mm. That's a good one. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and stop the poll results so we can see where we are with those and launch those so everyone can take a look. All right, so. Um, the big winner was taking a walk outside, which I think, I think makes sense, especially because we all have that sense of being extra cooped up now. now. Uh, so that, that's a good one. Uh, people like to sit outside, listen to the birds and nature too. We definitely need that outside time. Maureen, quite a few people also like having a treat. I see that. I just want to say I'm <laughs> on the same page, you guys. 60, almost 60%. Yay. Uh -huh. Um, in the chat, Maureen, people also shared some great ones. Um, a game on their phone. I'm not a big phone game person, but I have to say during Shelter in Place, I have downloaded a game and check in every day with that game. Um, so, oh, music, singing and playing guitar, coloring, lighting a candle. Um, while, while, this, while this webinar continues, please guys go ahead and take a look at these. This is especially important for you because we're going to be checking in with you every week on this topic because we do feel so strongly that the only way we're going to get through this well is to take care of ourselves and coming up for air is a great way to do that. So I'm going to sh stop sharing the results of that. Okay, so we're coming to the end and, and you know what we wanted to say is for some of you you know you may have been clinicians who work with trauma all the time. Some of you may not. And unfortunately, many of you are going to have to be working with trauma a whole lot more in the future. So here are some of the things that are, you know, are the kind of the general requirements that you want to pay attention to. First of all, understanding more about trauma. We gave you a little bit today, but we know that you need a lot more than this. So we've given you the references that you can peruse at your own time to figure out what you want to know and how you want to know it. Um, what you do when you're dealing with trauma is you provide emotional support, but you really have to tolerate and hold your client's pain. And I think those words are so, so important, especially that holding word. Um, you know, you're not making it go away. The person gives it to you, you hold it for a while, and when you give it back to them, it just weighs a little less. But you've kept some of it for yourself, which is where that fatigue comes from. You, know, you need to know a family perspective because even though a family lives together, everyone doesn't deal with the trauma in the same way. So you have to be under, unable to understand those developmental differences and recognize the long thread of loss. 
it's important to know that a loss in current time can reactivate losses from the past. And that's some of what we're going to talk about um, in our next webinar. You, though, have to be able to disengage strategically from all of this, because if you stay emotionally connected and empathic with your client or your student the whole time, you're going to be in the same mix, same mess they are, and you're not going to be able to help them see their way out of it. So you have to learn how to keep yourself out of the mix. And I think Marnie is going to take this to another level. We're talking a little bit about homework assignments. Yes, absolutely. And I just do want to acknowledge that we are um, going to run over by less than five minutes. Um, but I'm glad that we had the extra time. We've used the extra time to answer some questions and make sure this is tailored to what you guys need. We are, though, in the home stretch. So bear with us about five more minutes. Um, so. Here's the thing, um, we love the idea of having a webinar series and we love staying connected with you during that, which is why you have the workbooks, which I've heard several people say are really good, are really helpful or ready for them. During this next week, before our next webinar, we really want you to be kind to yourself. We want you to um, understand at the same time that this is a hard situation and it's okay to acknowledge that it's hard and it's difficult. You don't have to find the, sh the silver lining in this all the time or even at all. Um, please remember, like I mentioned with coming up for air, that the gift of time is not necessarily ours. You don't need a whole hour to take a break. Take five minutes, take three minutes, maybe on a good day, take 10, but do take those breaks. The workbook is not meant to be homework. It's more meant to be a way to keep this alive for you until we talk again. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and quickly describe the, uh, the activity that we put near the back of the workbook. It's your shelter in place map. We put this together as an opportunity for you to take a look at the before, during, and after of this shelter in place experience. I think we all can identify the time that was before. Maybe, maybe it was a day or a week or a moment where before ended and then this happened. What I'm asking you to do, and I said I used a, the word map, you can draw an actual map of your journey, you could make a timeline of your journey, or you could write a couple paragraphs about your journey. But I think it's a great opportunity to look at where you were before this happened, where you were going, what your landscape of your life was like, then what shifted, what changed initially, and then what's changed throughout this extended shelter in place time that we're having. And then take a moment after you've kind of caught up to the present with looking towards the future. What does the future look like? It might be cloudy for a lot of us because we don't even know what's gonna happen next and when that will be. And you know, that's, that's an uncertainty. But there probably are some things that you do know about the future. They could be goals that you've kept with you and you're going to keep going with them. They could be new things that have come up for you because of this. So there's space for you in your workbook to do that. It's um, an activity that if it works for you and it makes sense to you, might be useful to do with clients too. Thank you, Marnie. And I think what we wanted to say at the end um, to sum a lot of this up is don't forget not to take yourself too seriously. Um, it may be hard right now. This is one of Marty and I, um, our kind of favorite artists, um, Brian Andreas, and you'll see more of his work as we go through the next few weeks. But, um, you know, he has a way of sort of capturing the absurdity of the world um, in very simple language. And we thought um, this certainly spoke to Marty and I. Um, we, we don't run out of stupid things. But anyway, um, hopefully this will have some meaning for you. And finally, we wanted to leave you on a slightly more eloquent note um, with a quote from Shakespeare. Um, there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. Um, you see the person with the empty sack here, you're that person. Your job is to fill that empty sack that others are carrying around with the stars of support, empathy, validation, and occasionally wisdom. Um, we know we all have days that we feel that our own sacks are empty. So you want to reach up and reach out because we believe that you're going to find more stars together than you ever thought possible. You have more strength and skill than you can possibly ever know. Thank you all for listening.